Welcome back to Birding Basics. My name is Carolyn with the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society and today we are talking about pelicans. Now pelicans are one of those great birds where you don't have to search very hard to find them. They're not going to be hiding in the grass or on the top of a tree. And to be honest, if they were on top of a tree, you'd still be able to see them. Uh, you don't have to, you know, deal with the disbelieving looks of your, your non-birding friends and family who think you're just making up a bird. They know what a pelican is. Um, and to be honest, uh, IDing them, even if you've got multiple species in the area, is really easy. You're not going to have to puzzle out any confusing or minute field marks in order to get a positive ID on these birds. Um, and you know, let's, let's be honest, 2020 is is hard for so many reasons. Your birding doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and while I recognize that it is warbler season, uh, there are plenty of opportunities to test your birding abilities, to sit out in the middle of the field with your field guide um, and trying to puzzle out the, the small quick moving birds that are just zipping by you um, at strange angles and listening to songs. You know, not every birding expedition has to be that difficult. You can just go out to the baylands um, and and find some large, easily identifiable birds uh, that are just a lot of fun to watch. So let's take a look at our pelicans. What makes a pelican a pelican and which species we actually have here in the area. So we're going to start at the very beginning with these birds. There are eight species found throughout the world uh, for the pelican family. Uh, Pelicanidae. We have two of them here in North America, both of which are found here in California and which do occur within our county. Uh, so you can cross off the whole uh, continents portion of the pelicans with just one trip if you're lucky. So let's take a look at these guys at the very start. So this is a baby pelican. Um, there are lots of words you can use to describe them, many of which are not particularly nice, um, but they, they do grow out of this uh, phase. As you can see, they're all tritial young. So when they come out of the egg, when they're born, uh, they don't have any feathers, they're pretty helpless. Uh, and the parents have to do a lot of work in order to get these babies out and on their own. Uh, it takes about 150 pounds of food, uh, for each baby pelican to reach uh, the stage at which it's able to feed itself and leave the nest and the care of its parents. So that's a lot of work. As you can imagine, uh, sometimes that's not actually feasible. Uh, so chick mortality rate is relatively high. Pelicans will lay multiple eggs, um, but you know, uh, it's, it's tough to do there's not always a guarantee that that much food is going to be available. And these birds are nesting in groups, so there's, there's a lot of competition for food. Then moving on to our adult pelicans, the ones that you're actually going to be able to see um, moving out and about in the area. Let's take a look at their feet. So all the pelicans uh, and the pelicaniforms, which is the order they're in, uh, which does include birds like gannets and boobies, uh, have toady palmate feet. Now which, what this means is they have webbing between all four of their toes. This makes for a really effective paddling system. Uh, these are birds that spend a lot of time in the water. Uh, their legs and feet are adapted to it, so in addition to these gigantic webbed feet, uh, they've also got short, strong legs so they can push through the water. Um, they've got lots of leverage for that. Uh, what this does mean is if you thought that ducks or geese looked clumsy on the ground, um, you need to take a look at the pelicans as they're walking around because, man, they're, they're slow. Um, it's, it's a ponderous motion for these guys. They're not really well designed for the land. Um, good thing is they're really well adapted for flight and they are great in the water. So those gigantic... Completely webbed feet are a really good thing to look for. Um, they, they spread them out. They're pretty easy to spot because, once again, these are large birds. Um, 
The size range for the Pelican family is anywhere from a 6 foot wingspan to a 12 foot wingspan. These are some of the largest flying birds in the world. That does include the ones that we have here as well. Um, and unless you're chasing down something like a condor um, or an albatross, they're really some of the largest birds that you can find. Um, so very large water bird. Uh, that also means they are pretty easy to spot, uh, as I mentioned before. And then of course, you know, you can't talk about pelicans without also talking about their beaks and those pouches that everybody recognizes. Now the technical term for this pouch is the gular pouch. Pelicans aren't the only birds that have them, but they are the ones with the largest pouches, um, as many of you are aware. So this is kind of an, an odd angle for the picture. Um, if you look closely at the bottom, you can actually see that's the top of the head, and you've got the top portion of the bill sticking out there. But then we have the gular pouch that is, is stretched out and is catching the light of the sun. Uh, now, the beak itself is really flexible. Um, it's, it's long, it's fairly mobile too, uh, which is really important for the feeding strategies of these birds. Um, pelicans feed by scooping up fish from the water and also capturing the water itself. Um, now, this is a really important strategy because many of our fish eating birds have really sharp, either sharply pointed or serrated beaks. And that's important because in order to grab hold of a fish, uh, you have to be able to get a secure grip on it. And fish have a mucous membrane that does all sorts of things for them. And this is not a fish show, so we're not gonna go into detail on why that is. Um, but in order to overcome that adaptation of the fish, the pelicans just kind of go around it. They'll scoop up the fish and everything around it so there's no worry about it slipping away. They're not grabbing hold of the fish, they're grabbing hold of everything around it. And then they'll drain off that water uh, so they're not swallowing gallons of gallons of water, whether it's fresh or salt water. It's, it's no good for anything. Um, at, right before they've swallowed the fish itself. Now, this gular pouch is incredibly important for feeding. They rely on it very heavily, um, obviously, but it's also got a couple of other purposes. Now, as you can see from this picture, uh, there's veins that run all through the gular pouch and they're really close to the surface. And what this does is it kind of creates a heat sink for these birds. Pelicans actually use their gular pouches for thermoregulation. Um, the movement of that blood flow so close to the surface means that if they can find a shady area and just stretch that skin out, it'll bring down their body temperature in a very similar way that animals like elephants or jackrabbits use their ears, where they've got a ton of veins really close to the surface, um, over a large surface area, and that allows them to, to get rid of excess heat. Um, in addition to that, uh, gular pouches are used in breeding displays, uh, and it's a pretty frequent sight to see pelicans stretching their pouches out. Um, they'll, they'll tip their heads up, they'll, they'll stretch their necks in so it looks like it's actually coming out of the pouch, which is kind of freaky to see. Um, but all of that also helps keep that skin limber and soft, because once again, this is an incredibly important body part for the pelicans. Um, they're relying on that very, very heavily. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we have two species of pelicans here in North America and in California. Now, the first one of these is the American white pelican. Uh, as you can see, it lives up to its name. Uh, it is a large white bird, which does make it super easy to spot. Um, but you're going to notice that the primaries, those flight feathers on its wings and going into the secondaries, are black. Now, uh, this has a couple of purposes. Uh, the black pigmentation in feathers actually makes for a stronger feather, which is really important because these birds are flying over water in weather conditions that aren't always uh, favorable. So they can take quite a battering uh, so that the stronger, stiffer feathers um, holds up better than if the feathers were just white um, and would be, would be softer um, and more easily damaged. 
And it also means that they've got a really distinctive shape in the air. Because once again, they've got that gigantic beak that they can't do anything about. It's not like an egret or a heron's neck that they can fold back uh, to reduce their size to make it a little bit less awkward in the air. That beak is always going to be sticking straight out. And in addition, large white bird with those black wings. So it stands out really, really well. It makes it very easy to spot if it's in the air. Uh, now I said this was a large bird. It's got an eight foot wingspan. So um, once again, they're not hiding. Uh, they're easy to spot. People, I've, I've mentioned this before, people are not super great at figuring out the scale of things. We're not, we're not awesome at, at being able to guess the size of something. Uh, this holds especially true with birds who are covered in feathers, which makes their size actually pretty variable. They've got a fairly significant degree of control of how those feathers are laying on their bodies, so they can look larger and they can look smaller depending on uh, weather conditions, how, how they're holding themselves. Um, but this is pretty much the largest bird that you can spot in California, unless you go chasing condors. Um, but Condors are at such a number that you, know, you do have to go out of your way to find these them. Uh, so this is this is kind of the largest bird that you're going to be able to find on just a casual birding expedition in the county. Uh, so they do stand up for that. And the feeding strategies for these guys, they are fish eaters, uh, is a little bit interesting. So they're they're dabblers. Uh, what they'll do is they will swim on the water and they'll dip their beak in to catch fish. Now their gular pouch is so sensitive that they're actually able to do this at night where visibility is pretty much zero just by feeling movement with their pouch. Uh, but another interesting thing is they'll occasionally hunt cooperatively. So you'll see if you're out at Charleston Slough, uh, we've got several um, or a fairly large flock of pelicans that hangs out in Adobe Creek over there. Uh, and you'll actually see them just moving along the creek uh, in lines. And what they'll do is they'll corral fish in the shallows so that they can just scoop them up, uh, which is probably pretty terrifying for the fish, but it's very effective uh, for the pelicans themselves. And we do get a little bit of ver seasonal var variation with these birds. Um, the American white pelican grows like a horny projection on the top of its beak uh, that will shed outside of the springtime once breeding season is over. Uh, but during the breeding season, uh, we get really bright colors on the beak and the pouch. It's red and orange and yellow, and they've got a very distinctive horn that kind of, it, it looks a little bit like a rhinoceros horn. And uh, in form, it's, it's very, very similar. Uh, so it's a very distinct looking bird in the breeding season. We do have them here year round, um, though there is some local movement uh, that we see. Uh, and if you're trying to find these guys, Charleston Slough is a really reliable place for them. It's just between the border of Mountain View and Palo Alto by Shoreline Lake. Um, but you're also pretty likely to spot them if you're in Don Edwards, if you're exploring the salt ponds, anywhere along the bay, and they're pretty frequent visitors to our uh, interior reservoirs as well. Um, they're a migratory bird, but they're here year-round for us. Uh, for the rest of the country, it's an east-west migration, which does stand out. Uh, most of our migratory birds are doing a north-to-south movement. Um, so check the range maps. Uh, they're really more of a western species, um, so if you're, if you're past Illinois, um, it's really unlikely that you're going to spot them, um, but if they're in the area, they're visible. And that brings us to our next species, and really the only other species we've got here, our brown pelican. Once again, living up to its name, this is a brown bird. Now it's not as large as our American white pelican. Uh, it's got a wingspan of about six and a half to seven feet, but still, you know, uh, the size of an NBA player, um, just going through the air, flying over the water. Uh, now these birds aren't nearly as vibrant as the American white pelican, at least outside of the breeding season. And they're more coastal birds. So while we do get them here in Santa Clara County, along the bay. Uh, if you really want to search out these birds, get a reliable sighting, 
uh, somewhere like Half Moon, Mi Half Moon Bay, um, Monterey, along the, the fishing piers and on the boats uh, is, a, is a good, reliable spot for these birds. Now, that grayish brown does kind of blend in. They can be a little bit trickier to spot because they're not bright white. Um, and with our marine layer, it's, it does make it a little bit more difficult to spot them. But they are plunge divers. So when they are active, you're going to see them moving. So uh, in order to do a plunge dive for a bird this large, there's, there's a little bit of uh, extra work that has to go into it, uh, particularly because they're leading in with their beaks that has that really sensitive gular pouch attached to it. So they'll pull that in and they do kind of a corkscrewing motion. Uh, so the wings pull back, they're twisting in the air as they hit, um, they go on with a big splash and generally tend to come up with fish. Uh, and they can do this from up to 65 feet in the air. So it can be really dramatic. They'll fly in lines um, over the water along the coast and just plunge into the water one by one after schools of fishes, uh, which is just incredible to see. You can, you can spend a good morning just watching the pelicans feeding. And then once they've captured a fish, they'll sit on the water, they'll drain off the excess uh, water that's been captured in their gular pouch before they swallow that fish down. And you may notice that this brown pelican looks a lot more colorful than the one we were looking at before. And that's because it's in the breeding plumage. So uh, they get this really great yellowish white head, a white neck, and a red gular pouch during the breeding season. Um, it's a lot more vibrant than you would expect something that's called the brown pelican. It's very, very distinctive. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they're pretty frequent visitors to the docks um, and fishing boats. So you've got a pretty decent chance of actually seeing these guys just hanging out on the shore uh, and getting a really close look at them, which you might not otherwise be able to get if they're just flying along. Um, one thing to note with pelicans is they are not above kleptoparasitism. Uh, they are more than happy to steal catches from other birds, uh, from fishermen. Uh, so if there's fishing happening, whether it's animals or humans doing it, odds are pretty decent. There's also going to be pelicans in the area. Uh, so that's another thing to keep an eye out for if you're searching out a good place to find pelicans. Um, now, I mentioned brown pelicans are more of a coastal bird uh, than our American white pelican is. That being said, uh, you can find them fairly reliably within our county. Uh, last week, we had a flock of at least 20 hanging out around uh, Shoreline and Charleston Slough. Um, but the salt ponds and Don Edwards are also fairly reliable spots to actually find these birds. So. It's pretty easy to find an area where you can, in fact, cross off both of these birds off of your county or your year list. Uh, and they're just a ton of fun to watch. So it's a three-day weekend coming up. Uh, take a time to do some easy birding. Uh, walk along the bay, wear your mask, keep an eye on the air quality, and just watch some really interesting fishing birds going about their day. And with that, have a great rest of your week, and I will see you all next time.